Mr. Speaker, before I start my contribution, I was, I've been asked by a constituent of mine, a 90-year-old lady from Tours, to say this verse from Joshua 1 to 9. She says, she, she asked me to say, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Mr. Speaker, allow me also to wish my colleague and friend from Viewfort North a happy birthday. Mr. Speaker, as I make my contribution on the budget, I cannot help comment on the emotional, financial, and physical state of the island of St. Lucia at this time. This budget presented yesterday is nothing more than a list of aspirations with no strategy to achieve anything. A list of the usual empty promises, and with the absence of strategy, it was no surprise that there were so many contradictory statements. A major area of concern for us Lucians is the uncertain and deteriorated state of our health care system. The Prime Minister's budget gave, gave no indication of when the national insurance, health insurance scheme would come into force. And if, as it looks, given the amount of work needed for the scheme, it will not be in place during this fiscal year. How then will the operation of the new Okay, EU hospital be funded if, as he promised, it will be open in the fiscal year 2018 19. Let us not forget, he made similar promises about the opening of the St. Jude Hospital. He said it would be opened by December 2016. The Prime Minister made much of transparency and accountability in his budget address as, he, as if he believed in it. According to him, it will take $100 million to complete St. Jude, and therefore it will be an unlikely decision of the government to continue with the hospital. If that is the basis of the government's decision, he should table the relevant report in the parliament in the spirit of transparency so that its findings can be assessed. This is far too important a matter to be concealed from the public. Your words are not enough on this issue, Mr. Prime Minister. We need the relevant information. Otherwise, the citizens will rightly believe that there are other reasons why this government wants to discontinue work on St. Jude Hospital. The redevelopment of the Uenora International Airport is another matter. I have more to say about that later. However, your uncertainty regards to its opening and commencement and completion of works, no details were provided except it would be only done in phrases. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister in his budget states on page 47 that our public debt continues to grow as a consequence of deficits from previous budgets. The figures in the Social and Economic Review show that under his administration, all the deficits increased, a reverse trend from the decreasing deficits of previous years. He promised no new taxes, but he has committed minibus drivers, fishermen, taxi drivers, and other, motorists, and other motorists to an increase in the price of gasoline by over $1 per gallon. Is the fuel surcharge not a tax, Mr. Speaker? A tax that would impact on the cost of living and affect negatively on most solutions. A sector that will feel a burden of that tax, Mr. Speaker, is the fishing sector. Mr. Speaker, a Leopardy government understands the difficulties that fisher folk undergo every day. A Leopardy government will take measures to relieve the burden of the fuel tax on the fisher folk in St. Lucia. The health insurance levy is another new tax. The Prime Minister expressed concern about the negative impact of high debt servicing commitments on the ability of government to meet the education and social needs of the nation but he is willingly lending the proceeds of our passport sales to foreign investors at a concessionary rate of 2% under the CIP program 
while his government is borrowing at the rate of 5 to 8 percent in the open market. This budget has been prepared against a background of a certain mindset of this government. Never mind the list of aspirations. A mindset of vindictiveness, high-handedness, and a dangerous anti-solution spirit, which will further divide and erode the social fabric of this, of this country. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party believes that the so-called investigations are a witch hunt aimed at intimidating the opposition and forcing us into silence. Let me make it clear. The opposition will not be silenced or threatened by any... The opposition will not be, will not be silenced or threatened by any kangaroo court. And I have full confidence in the members of my team. The Labour Party will be resolute in defending our, our parliamentarians and our legacy. Mr. Speaker, when I speak of vindictiveness, I speak of the proud and boastful statement of a minister who seems not to care with the families of a thousand nice workers who lost their jobs. Because by his own admission, more than 95% of them were supporters of the Labour Party. He later shamelessly bragged that he had made a mistake in that initial number and he had understated it. It was only 80%. Mr. Speaker, it may be comfortable for the bragging minister to hurt and try to ridicule me, but to cause former employees of NICE to suffer and cry by dismissing them from their jobs is heartless. These 1,000 people have children and families who depended on the NICE salary for their survival. Then another minister referred to some civil servants as labor hacks who were, who were impeding the progress of the government. Mr. Speaker, I ask, was that the reason for the dismissal of the workers at the St. Lucia Tourist Board and Radio St. Lucia? Was there no regard by the government for the mortgages and student loan commitments? Was that what was meant when the words, you just start to cry, were uttered in this honorable house? And the pattern continued with a food minister abusing the immunity of his honorable house to attack and castigate a civil servant who was interviewed and legally hired by the Public Service Commission. Not to be outdone, the Prime Minister launches an attack on the former CEO of the CIP unit, aimed at castigating aspersions at the member for Cash Resolve, but instead damaging the future career opportunities of a citizen from his constituency. The government has embarked on wholesale political cleansing of thousands of people on the nice, a situation unique to this government and unprecedented in the history of St. Lucia. All of this practice and said in the presence of the Prime Minister and with his tacit approval of the, uncaring, of the uncaring and heartless actions of his ministers. Mr. Speaker, I speak of that vindictiveness because I'm sure that this budget will not yield much good since the population continues to be threatened by a government that is determined to be revengeful and to make its opponents cry. It's that thinking that has caused the government to withdraw the subvention from national trust. The first government to do so in over 40 years since the creation of that subvention by Sir John Compton. Mr. Speaker, according to an official of the Folk Research Center, our culture has suffered in recent times and the evidence is there for all to see. The stopping by the UDAP government of the Derrick Walcott Museum and theater project in Grass Street in Central Castries, the closure of the Walcott House, the uncertainty surrounding the relocation of the Cultural Center, and now, sadly, the unfortunate fire at the Folk Research Center. I want to reiterate that the Labour Party government will immediately reinstate the annual submission to the National Trust. I also want to assure non-government organizations in receipt of government subventions that it will never be the policy of the St. Lucia Labour Party government to victimize any organization which expresses a different view on any development project or program being promoted by this government. 
whether it be a dolphin park or anything of that nature. Mr. Speaker, this budget is premised on the theory that government must be run like a business. This administration speaks of running the government as a business, as if it was some forward-thinking initiative that would increase and improve the quality of public services. Mr. Speaker, running the government was never intended to be a high-level business model. Government and businesses are at different ends of the consortium of the provision of services. Governments are about providing public services that are driven and motivated by the need to serve the common good. Businesses, on the other hand, are about providing services that are essentially driven and motivated by the creation of profits. These are two very different approaches. The first addresses the need of every citizen, especially those most vulnerable, and the other is concerned with only those who have resources to pay for their services and profits for shareholders. So this idea of running a country like a business is flawed and misguided and is only likely to serve a few at the expense of the majority. I'm in no way condemning the role of business in the development of our country. We need businesses and they are an essential part of our economic landscape. However, their reach in meeting the needs of our society is limited to those with the financial resources to pay for their services. This government cannot be the referee and player in the same space. Government exists to ensure workers and all businesses are treated fairly by creating the neighboring and legal environment for the actors to have a fair chance of, of succeeding. If the Prime Minister wants to join the business model, he should draw upon the more relevant and applicable aspects of the operations, good corporate governance structures, where directors account to their shareholders for their stewardship, for audited financial statements, operating within the rules of the corporation, respecting the right of workers as stakeholders, directors and directors being prepared to answer questions about their stewardship. It is clear that a good governance structure is not of any interest to this government. They continuously flood procurement and other rules that were intended for good order, transparency, and accountability. They give away the resources of the country and feel no need to account for taxes to foreign companies, feel no need to account for taxes. Foreign companies get taxes waived. Vast sums of land rented for pittance to a foreign entity, less than one dollar per acre. The wages of foreign companies paid by taxpayers. This government is prepared to take risks that they would never dream of taking with their own funds, if it were their own money. This Prime Minister and his ministers have adopted a position of arrogance, forgetting they are in power to represent the interests of the citizens of this country, and that he, the Prime Minister, is supposed to be the agent. He does not listen to the voices of concern about the reckless path he's taking this country. His behavior is now clearly about looking after, after the interests of friends, family, and foreigners. Mr. Speaker, a Labour Party government understands that we are in government to represent the interests of the citizens of St. Lucia. An SAP government that I lead will never threaten or intimidate the opposition or the press. We categorically object to any form of press censorship, especially when it is selective and aimed at threatening and victimizing particular show and talk show hosts. We believe that the public will, the will be the final arbiter of what is true and what is not true. And the government, aided by access to tax-funded consultants, press advisors, and tax-funded media. Mr. Speaker, this arrogance of power, revengefulness, boastfulness, and callous nature of this government has caused this country widespread pain and suffering, not to mention loss of opportunity for the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, opportunities have been lost in all sectors. We have lost two years of projects, two years of economic, educational, social, and sporting opportunities. In every aspect of the development of Ireland, 
we can find that the misguided policies of vindictive, vindictiveness and revenge and the desire to crush the legacy of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Even the jazz festival has been stopped. There are many examples, Mr. Speaker, that I will deal with later in my presentation. I want at this point to mention the $24 million meat processing, processing plant at Viewfort, initiated by the member for Barbano, and which the St. Lucia Labour Party government continued, improved, and completed. Now, only to be marked for demolition by the UDAP regime. And would you believe, Mr. Speaker, that this government, which claims to be a farmer's government, is also stopping livestock farming in, in the Bosnian area in Vivot? Has the government figured out the impact on the diplomatic relations between our island and Taiwan? Is that the difference in ideology that the Prime, that the prime Minister and Minister of Finance spoke about recently? An SLP government will respect the contribution of our diplomatic friends and never squander or pay such scant regard to their generosity to our island. We are well aware that it's taxpayers of, this con of these countries who make sacrifices to provide this assistance. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Prime Minister that the six constituencies represented by the opposition have not been consulted on the use of CDP funds in their constituencies. And this is not in keeping with the spirit of the CDP. Mr. Speaker, the budgetary proposals as outlined by the Prime Minister must be considered in the context of rising deficits and lower surpluses and a widening deficit on the merchants or on the merchandise trade accounts. The social and economic review states that the trade deficit increase to 1.55 billion of 44.5% of GDP in 2016, from 1.35 billion of 40.4% of GDP in 2015. The negative balance of trade is due to a large extent to the, to the wider deficit on the merchandise trade account. It is estimated that the merchandise trade deficit further widened by, by 41.9%. This imbalance is due to an estimated $190 million worth of imports of diesel and related items, particularly in the generation of electricity. One would expect that a government concerned with rising deficits would make a concerted effort to reduce the high oil import bill and reduce the cost of electricity generation and engage in energy renewable projects. Mr. Speaker, as I stated earlier, electricity generation is costly, and the provision of street lighting from the present high-pressure sodium and mercury vapor street lights is a costly venture of $9 million per year for the taxpayer. In spite of what the Prime Minister says in his budget about energy saving, the government of St. Lucia has cancelled a loan from the CDB for $10.6 million U.S. dollars and a grant of 300,000 U.S. US dollars to replace 21,500 high electricity consuming bulbs with high, high efficiency low energy bulbs. Changing these bulbs would reduce our island street lighting costs and greenhouse gas emissions. The project was found, was found to be so necessary for the economic well-being of St. Lucia, that the CDB agreed on a waiver of its lending policies so as to allow the government of St. Lucia to borrow 90% of the cost of the project instead of the 80%. The CDB also agreed to a waiver of the CDB guidelines for procurement and to permit Lucille to apply the private sector procurement methods permitted on the CDB lending policies. Why then, why then would the government not accept this loan, which was approved in May 2016, the results of negotiations of the St. Lucia Labour Party? However, in 2018, the government speaks about energy saving and climate change. Mr. Speaker, this decision by the government 
illustrates a pattern of behavior as it relates to procurement of goods and awarding of contracts. The government preferred, preferred to frustrate the project and to forego the opportunity only because ministers would not be able to determine by, the, by direct award who would be awarded the contract. Mr. Speaker, another example of the private interest of friends, family coming be before the people of St. Lucia. The lack of support given to the investor at the Denry Wind Farm project is another example, is another example of government's double standards as it relates to energy and climate change. These projects were long overdue and would commence the process of improving our island's carbon footprint long before. The people of St. Mr. Speaker, have been told for a long time that the Roseau Dam needs to be desilted to return it to its maximum capacity. The Labour Party government negotiated and agreed with a consortium of lenders to a project with its main objective to ensure a reliable climate and resilient supply of potable water to residents and businesses in the north and to enhance the management and operational capacity of Wasco. A component of the project was the rehabilitation of the John Compton Dam Reservoir to its original capacity of 3 million cubic meters. Funding of 14.7 million was secured from the European Investment Bank, the EIB, and the Inter-American Development Bank, the EDP, and the Caribbean Development Bank for that purpose. The loan was approved with a grace period of five years and was only waiting for government guarantee. The project was launched in November 2015 with the following ancillary works to be undertaken. Repairs to spillway and access road, development of supplementary intakes, installation of dam, equipment capacity and capacity building at Wasco, Tetshime Rainwater Harvesting Initiative, with restoration of the watershed and project management and monitoring. Mr. Speaker, con considering the sustainable goals of the project, why is the government delaying for so long to conform to the institutional lenders? To conform to the rules, guidelines, and processes and move to guaranteeing this loan? Mr. Speaker, I can tell you why. This pattern of government in dealing with infrastructural projects is now well established and easy to detect. The level of accountability required by institutional lenders does not facilitate their theme of looking after their friends, family, and foreigners. The process of institutional lenders require transparency and accountability, and in so far that they can avoid these principles of good governance, they will. Wasco, for a special levy, have been collecting funds for the desilting of that dam. That money is now partly available. So now they are free to grant contracts, unencumbered, as they see it fit, because the money is there. Some money is there. To the owners of heavy equipment that they favor to commence the desilting process. And who would these contractors be? The usual friends and family. Speaking of equipment, Mr. Speaker, I have noticed an influx of trucks of all categories and heavy equipment imported in the island and being used on our roads and seen clearing a, a site in at least one location at VG. You may recall, Mr. Speaker, that the then government arguably reduced vehicle licenses for truckers and owners of heavy equipment, so as to give owners of truckers and equipment an opportunity to improve their business. Now the government has not only not reduced the licenses as they promised, but they have allowed the importation of trucks and heavy equipment, most likely duty-free, to compete with local owners. Mr. Speaker, this is yet another example of the double standards of this government. Mr. Speaker, the 260 million grant from the British was negotiated when the St. Lucia Labour Party was in office. 
and was intended to be used to construct a north-south link, link road, which would, in a real way, open hundreds of acres of land accessible for economic growth and development. A first visibility study report had been prepared with a grant, a funding grant from the Caribbean Development Bank. Why would the government cancel such a project? The only reason I can proffer is an attempt to excise the legacy of the Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, I am sure that you are aware of the frustrating traffic situation of the Grosley Castries Highway. The inordinate amount of time it takes for commuters to journey across a 10-mile route is not only unnecessary, but highly unproductive. Mr. Speaker, you heard the Prime Minister speaking of road infrastructure and plans for the improvement of roads in the island. It's the same Prime Minister who cancelled a loan by OFID and KFED for the upgrading of the road from Shock to Grosile and the improvement and rehabilitation of a number of secondary roads. The scope of the project included widening of the existing two-lane road to a four-lane dual carriageway, upgrading of seven junctions, construction of ten overhead footbridges, addition of another northbound lane to eliminate the existing bottlenecks. With the growth of the population in the north and commercial activity, it's surprising and puzzling that the government would cancel such a loan. But then again, their film must persist to satisfy the needs of family and friends. The lending requirements of international financial agencies concerning procurement must be avoided at every turn by this government, even if it means canceling loans agreed to by the previous government. Mr. Speaker, the Millennium Highway project should have started a long time ago. In June 2016, the OPEC Fund for International Development, OFID, approved a loan of 116.6 million U.S. to undertake renovations and resurfacing of the Millennium Highway. The loan was at an interest rate of 5%. 60 million, yeah. The loan was at an interest rate of 5%. That loan was cancelled. Mr. Speaker, the infrastructure projects mentioned were either started, initiated, or negotiated by the Labour Party government. If the government, instead of wasting time on investigation and trying to change procurement rules and interfering in the appointment of contractors, trying to change contractors, many of these projects would have been completed in the 22 months since they have been in office. These include projects to be financed under the DVRP, the Denry Infant and Primary School, the Schozer Secondary School, the Denry Polyclinic, the rehabilitation of the Sufra Hospital. Many and many other projects should have already started. The, the, there are others. These include the Marcus Garvey Community Center, the Robo Community Center, and the PI Community Center. All these projects financed under the DVRP. The GNET program, which the Prime Minister boasts about, which he just started, was approved in 2015. That too should have been completed. Mr. Speaker, I come to the vexing issue of the state of health in St. Lucia, a cause of great concern to the public and the medical professionals. Let me take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the nurses and doctors who work in the healthcare system. The St. Lucia Labour Party and the people of St. Lucia will continue to appreciate your service and as a government, we'll always try our best to improve your well-being and welfare. I will admit that as a country, we have always faced healthcare challenges. But I can state without fear or contradiction that the leadership of this government on this issue has been as uncaring as it could ever be. No government has been so clueless, directionless, and hopeless like the present United Workers' Party government. Let me say to this Prime Minister and his government, 
you were elected to govern the country. It's time you stop making excuses and casting blame on others. If you can handle, then it's time to get out because people are dying at St. Jude's in increasing numbers because of your inactivity. Mr. Speaker, the last government of the Sanusha Labour Party understood the complexities of the provision of affordable health services to the country and invited the opposition to participate in a bipartisan committee on health financing. The then opposition, UWP, were not interested and unwilling to cooperate on that issue. Today, they are faced with a responsibility and are now blaming others why they are not delivering. In the meantime, the Prime Minister makes his usual off-the-cuff comments about plans for the future of the healthcare services of St. Lucia. It is instructive, Mr. Speaker, as we look back and review the situation of health services in St. Lucia on June the 6, 2016, when the UWP voted into power, and now 22 months later, how much has health care deteriorated and its future plagued into uncertainty with the talk of privatization? We believe that health care is a right of every citizen. This requires that the government approaches it prudently and objectively and considers all the available options regarding the governance, management, finance, regulation, oversight, and outsourcing of any health care services in the best interest of the citizens. This is best done with a transparent and accountable framework of open dialogue and, cons and consultation with key stakeholders and the public whose right to accessible, affordable, and quality health care must be, be protected. Such an important matter must not remain shrouded in secrecy, must be brought, must be brought to light. The critical issues of health care financing and health insurance coverage must endure the highest levels of scrutiny to guarantee optimal use of our limited financial resources while providing value for money in services delivered to the public. Mr. Speaker, let us reflect on the St. Jude's issue. In June 6, 2016, work was continuing on the construction of St. Jude's Hospital. The footprint of this project had, be, had been expanded by the UWP government in August 2011, but no additional funds had been secured to match the expansion. Mr. Speaker, it is considered normal and prudent practice for a new client to seek from the project manager the state of construction when a project is handed over. Simple, Mr. Speaker. If you are building a house, and one contractor leaves, you expect well, that when the new contractor comes, he's given a handover certificate. He's told, here is where we are, and that's what we have to do. This government, upon assuming office in 2016, chose to conceal the fact that they had in their possession A document called the St. Jude Hospital Reconstruction Project Handover Report for the period ending 14 August 2016. The report was not prepared by politicians. It wasn't prepared by the member for Labbury or the member for Viewfort or the member for Viewfort South or Viewfort North. It was prepared by the technical civil servants working on the hospital. And I will and Mr. Speaker, if you allow me, I am going to give you the people, the project steering committee who prepared that report and who were involved in the hospital construction. You'll find no politician there. Mr. Honorable Member, is this a document of the house? If you want it I can be. It's up to you, Mr. It's up to what honorable members want. It doesn't matter. The mem the, the people who on the committee, the people who were involved in the project management, not the member from Viewfort North, not the member from Viewfort South, 
not a member from library. The poor man secretary, Department of Economic Development. The poor man secretary, the Ministry of Health. The deputy poor man secretary, Department of Economic Development. The chairperson of the St. Jude Hospital Board of Directors. The chief executive officer, St. Jude Hospital. The chief health planner in the Ministry of Health. Representative of the Ministry of Health, representative of the Office of the Budget, and representative of the D Department of Economic Development and the project manager. The project management team, the project management unit, was staffed by a project manager, a project officer, a junior project assistant, and a finance and administrative officer and an accountant. The government, the report provided a detailed account of the state of play under the following captions. One, background and project overview. Two, project management. Three, project finance. Four, issues, challenges, and constraints. And finally, outstanding issues for action. Mr. Speaker, if the government really wanted to find out the situation at St. Jude, they could have studied, discussed, made public that document, and engaged the project management team on a way forward. Instead, the government acted in bad faith. Instead, the government acted in bad faith, concealed the document from the public. You say, where? Document that they are the co-yotee and Saint Jude. You say we, you pay the moon yotee ni. The document and embarked on a one-man crusade to discredit the work going on at Saint Jude. Document that they ni sate kafet. Papiers politician kifei. Engineer ek moon kifei. Doc document sala. You say we, you pay the moon yoni a document kosa. Et yon ministre commence à jouer et débarrer. In its usual callous manner, the government embarked on a torrid dose of misinformation aimed at trying to make the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party look bad. The police, the, the police, the hard working police, were used to invade and search the homes of businesses, the homes and businesses of private individuals in search of government property. When the Hanover the document had clearly stated where these items had been stored, and the objective was not a search for truth, but instead a witch hunt against individuals they deem to be supporters of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Then the government, still on its agenda of trying to discredit the work to date at St. Jude, commissioned an almost $1 million audit of St. Jude's, and the results of which are yet to be made public. What, what, was, this, what was not known by the public at that time was that the government was creating an environment to create an environment to announce the demolition of St. Jude's or the alternative use for the buildings at St. Jude. So they created the environment of fear, of things are not good, of doors, there are no windows, no air condition, no place for stretchers to pass. All when a document clearly outlined what was wrong, what had to be done, and how it had to be solved. What the public did not know, Mr. Speaker, that the government was creating an environment to, for the demolition or the alternative use of St. Jude Hospital. And for what purpose? To facilitate some pipe dream DSH project. It is believed that the location of St. Jude is within the equine disease free zone. And that would be a threat and that would be a threat to the horses that they intend to bring. 
Mr. Speaker, the people are telling the government in very clear terms to change course on St. Jude. But it's not listening. You see, you speak about health and people dying and they're laughing. That's, that's it. You see, that is the, 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 the contempt. You're speaking about health. You're speaking about St. Jude's Hospital. You're speaking about putting, putting people before horses and they're laughing. Mr. Speaker, the people are telling the government in very clear terms to change course on St. Jude. But the government is not listening. The Prime Minister has in his possession over 11,000 signatures from St. Lucians home and abroad. But he's adamant. He's a boss. It's his way or the byway. The question must be asked. Who is this Prime Minister and the government there to represent? Mr. Speaker, your position is convinced that there is no reasonable justification for the government to have stopped work on St. Jude. When we were last in government, the St. Lucia Labour Party inherited, inherited a St. Jude's hospital under construction, and we continued the work with a view to competing it. And so, this government should have done the same. Because the people of the South deserve better. They must not be allowed to suffer and die on account of a selfish government with a misguided, narrow agenda of looking after their friends, family, and foreigners. And if you have to calculate the time in which the United Workers' Party had dominion over the St. Jude's Hospital and the St. Lucia Labour Party, you will find that both, of us, both parties had the same time. The Labour Party had, both parties had the same time. Our position is clear. The government has created a crisis which need not be. We insist that there should be no alternative use, no demolition, and the government moves speedily to complete St. Jude. This is our position and the position of the people of the South and the wider St. Lucian public. The OKEU Hospital. Mr. Speaker, the decision to construct the new hospital was taken in 2002 after an extensive review of existing plans to rehabilitate, to rehabilitate Victoria Hospital built in 1887. And you remember the late Romanus Lanzigo with his walking for Victoria started from that time. The new hospital has been in the making for 16 years. There has been discussion of the new hospital. There was extensive design and stakeholder consultation on the new national hospital. And the EU had agreed to finance the bulk of the cost towards the Owen King EU hospital. The intention at the time was to maintain the Victoria Hospital site as an urban polyclinic for the people of Castries. Mr. Speaker, if one listens to the government, one would think that the last government had no plans for OKU or for health. This, of course, is not the case. The government, as usual, refuses to speak the truth, trying their best to destroy the legacy of the Labour Party. A legacy, however hard they may try, they can never destroy, destroy, because the light of the truth will always expose lies and acts of deception. Mr. Speaker, the government had in its possession, when they came into office in June 2016, 2016, a document prepared by Ministry of Health officials called New National Hospital Commissioning Project Status Report, not prepared by the Minister of Health at the time, not prepared by the Prime Minister at the time, but prepared by the staff of Victoria Hospital. It's called, Mr. Speaker, New National Hospital Commissioning Project Status Report, prepared by the staff. Again, this document has been kept a secret. 
the, the 18 page report on your bill. would these documents be made documents of the house honorable leader of the opposition yes. with pleasure with pleasure with pleasure with pleasure with great pleasure with great pleasure and comfort and ease the new national hospital mr speaker the government has in its possession a report which they kept a secret called New National Hospital Commissioning Reports. Commissioning Status Report as at March 2016. The 18-page report details the way forward, including financial requirements for the commissioning of the new hospital. The budget estimates for the additional resources required to commission a new hospital was included as a new spending request. Honorable Member, yes. you have 15 minutes remaining to conclude your contribution. Um, extra time now? Mr. Speaker, I beg for the suspension of Standing Order 32-8 to allow the Leader of the Opposition and Member for Castries East an additional 45 minutes to conclude his presentation. I have 15 minutes left on the hour. Yes. Yes, sir. 45 and 15 is two. So you have to have the same time as the other. 45 Yeah, no, no. I have 15 more minutes on the hour. Honorable members, leader, uh, member for the library, how much time did you ask for? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Honorable Member, the question is that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition be granted an additional 45 minutes. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. You may Thank continue. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Members. The 18-page report, Mr. Speaker, details the way forward, including, including financial requirements for commissioning of the new hospital. Part of the process was the setting up of new legislation. In 2015, the Millennium Heights, Com the Millennium Heights Medical Complex Act was passed. And this UDAP government should, now, should have now passed the other piece of legislation needed for the, com the commissioning of the new hospital. It's called the medical records and mental health bills, which have been in the office of the Attorney General. These bills provided the legal environment for the administration of the OKEU hospital. Mr. Speaker, the divestment of our public health assets into private hands is a very serious matter. One that requires broad national consultation, transparency, access to information, and a detailed risk-benefit analysis so as not to disadvantage the public whose greater social good should never be sacrificed for political and economic expediency. Mr. Speaker, the governance structure contemplated for the OKEU hospital was a statutory board, not a private company. A statutory, a statutory board is a completely different entity to a private company or public-private partnership. The composition of a statutory board is appointed by a designated minister of government or the cabinet. Private companies are run by a board of directors appointed by shareholders of the company. What is, what is so difficult to understand and to confuse these two models. The Labour Party government never intended to privatize the OKEU hospital, and the Prime Minister should cease from saying that. Mr. Speaker, when the UDAP came into power, the Ministry of Health had engaged an HR consultant 
to develop an HR manual to include a performance appraisal system with respect to contracting policies to the contracting policies of the medical complex. The Ministry of Health had explored the possibilities of increasing capacity through a through an, a collaborative effort with the European Union to cover initial short-term and long-term training in intensive care and radiology. As early as October 2015, the first staff-wide consultation was completed with 90% of Victoria Hospital and 70% of the mental wellness staff. By March 2016, the following had been accomplished as it related to the administration of the OKEU hospital. One, staff and facility orientation had commenced, with the staff of the Mental Wellness Center being first routed through the new national hospital. Two-thirds of the staff had completed the formalization talk. Phase one. Phase one testing of the primary systems of the new national hospital had commenced with all the electrical, mechanical, and fixed equipment being tested. Certification of the radiology department had been, in, had been initiated with the finalization of the terms of reference and potential engagement of a physicist to undertake the certification. Mr. Speaker, I now move to counterpart facilities. Mr. Speaker, the work on the counterpart facilities to complete the new hospital had begun. Work had started on the telecommunications, the cafeteria, the laundry, the kitchen, and the link road, and the car park at a total cost of approximately $10 million. Mr. Speaker, a modern information system is a necessity for a 21st century hospital. Through a tendering process of the Central Tenders Board, the firm Rio Med, the contract was awarded to, to that firm to install and commission the new software platform for the medical complex at a cost of $5 million over a period of five years. I now move to equipment for, for the new hospital. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party government, by February 2016, had secured all the equipment for the OKEU hospital. In order to secure the final equipment lots for the new hospital, the extension of the DS plus 3, Mr. Speaker, DS plus 3 is a funding source used at the EU, was facilitated for the collaboration of the National Authorizing Officer. Final approval had been issued on July 31st, 2015 by a Brussels delegation. The remaining equipment procurement was facilitated through a negotiated procedure at a cost of $9 million in February 2016. All the remaining equipment lots were contracted and in March 2016, all commencement orders were issued. All equipment should have been installed, commissioned, and training completed by September 2016. Mr. Speaker, 22 months later, the government has, has done nothing and is now debating on the way forward for the OKEU hospital. This is another example of the callous an uncaring nature of this government. There are a group of men and women drunk with power and floundering all over the place, filled with rage and hatred, trying to obliterate the legacy of labor. In the meantime, the hospital remains closed, and as usual, pretending nothing was done, but planning, nevertheless, to find the next opportunity to enrich their friends, family, and foreigners. Mr. Speaker, it is shameful that this government has done nothing to commission the new hospital. Even after the technocrats in the Ministry of Health had worked so hard with the officials of the EU
to allow St. Lucian's access, full access, to the new hospital. Mr. Speaker, I now move to health financing. The Prime Minister gives the impression that the St. Lucian Labour Party government never planned or contemplated how it would handle the issue of health financing. The St. Lucia Labour Party government has always advocated universal health care. The St. Lucia Labour Party government has always advocated universal health care. The previous Labour Party government, under the first phase of universal health care, had planned for free medication for diabetes, and in phase two, free medication for diabetes and high potential. The St. Lucia Labour Party administration, between 2011 and 2016, had commissioned a study, had commissioned a study called the development of a sustainable financial mechanism for the St. Lucia health sector. This study completed in March 2015, had been discussed by officials of the Ministry of Health and Finance, after extensive discussions with all stakeholders, including community groups. Several financial options were proposed. Employment business earnings, a small portion of the VAT earnings, assignment of insurance benefits in private plans, government support of primary care, government support of secondary care, and payment by non-citizens for health care. Mr. Speaker, these options were not prepared by politicians but by experienced health economists, planners, and financial experts. Mr. Speaker, the government has not discussed with the public what the United Nations has recommended, which is free, prior, and informed consent in consultation. It is ready to impose a health insurance scheme on St. Lucians, and privatize the health services are in the process causing consternation among health professionals, the very people upon whom the success of the hospital depends. Mr. Speaker, allow me to quote from the Health and Human Rights Journal of 2014. And I quote, private provision of health services does not change the role of the state as the ultimate guarantor of the realization of health rights obligations. But it makes implementing its responsibilities more difficult. Fragmentation of the health system complicates oversight and the promotion of a rights-based approach to health. Segmentation of the health system with a poorly functioning public sector catering primarily to the poor and better quality private health institutions, catering to the more affluent tends to undermine support for investing in improvements in institutions for the public provision and financing of health care, and likely erodes commitment to the right to health as well. Additionally, the goals and priorities of private health care institutions tend to differ, often significantly, from the values and norms in the human rights paradigm. Working effectively and through private sector providers also requires management skills and complex health information systems that many governments, particularly those in poor and middle-class countries, lack. Mr. Speaker, the Senusha Labour Party believes that the government's position on health financing is flawed, ill-conceived, and misdirected. There has not been sufficient discussion and consultation with the health professionals and the people of St. Lucia on this proposed privatization. <coughs> it shows a certain contempt for the citizens of this country and the health professionals who run our health service. Against this background of no consultation, privatization of the health sector, the OK hospital, or health insurance is doomed for failure. Mr. Speaker, what has been achieved since the last budget? Mr. Speaker, my colleagues with great ease will illustrate the non-performance of this government as it relates to promises made in last year's budget. I will deal with only the economic policy pronouncements. 
In 2017, 2018, the following were promised. A credit bureau, a public finance management bill, Simpli simplification of the PAY system, including reforms of allowances and deductions, and changes in personal income tax, development and implementation of a medium-term debt management strategy, confirmation of financing for Huanora Airport, five to 800 jobs in phase one of the SH, comprehensive incentive package which will create employment within the private sector. Work should have, will commence on Honeymoon Bay Resort very soon that will consist of two hotels, golf course, promises fulfilled. Have any of these projects started? How can anyone have faith in what the Prime Minister is saying or promising in this year's budget? Here's my problem with the Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. The Prime Minister has stated too many projects and too many things that have never happened to a point where it's difficult to have any confidence in what he says. And as, and as the chief article of this budget, it is difficult to have any confidence in any pronouncements that may offer hope of better days. Mr. Speaker, the member for Cash South will speak directly to the tourism policy of the government. Mr. Speaker, it's 4.50, I started, I, I had 45 minutes from, huh? Mr. Speaker, the member for Cash Reserve will speak directly to the tourism policy of this government. There has been no innovative strategies, no innovative marketing strategies. It's the same thing when I was there. St. Lucia Week, World Travel Market, same thing. There, were, there have been no innovative marketing strategies or product development initiatives within the tourism industry since this government has come into power. But they have. They have dismissed 25 members of the Social Tourist Board. They have sent them home. 25 people. The government claims increased numbers, but fails to recognize the Royalton Hotel's contribution to the hotel stock completed negotiated under the last Labour Party government. The UDIP fails to mention the increasing cruise numbers is due to a large extent to the devastation of the northern Caribbean islands following the passage of Hurricane Oma, causing cruise ships to be redirected to St. Lucia. In terms of our readiness to accommodate the increased volume and size of cruise ships, the improvements to point seraphine boven facilities were initiated by the St. Lucia Labour Party government. The government, the government has not encouraged the growth and development of high quality boutique properties and guest houses. There are many success stories in the local hotel industry. Bay Gardens, Le Sport, Anchasne, Auberge Seraphine, Coco Palm. However, the government's policy is to encourage a foreign dominated hotel ownership structure. Philosophically, the government appears to believe that St. Lucians should not strive to be owners of hotels or wealth creators but remain in a permanent state of wage dependency. The St. Lucia Labour Party will encourage foreign direct investment in our tourism industry and will make direct policy interventions that promote and create an enabling environment for locals to be part of the industry at the highest possible levels. A Labour Party will endeavor to return the jazz festival to its previous position as one of the best musical festivals in the world. Foreign Affairs. As a small island developing state, the pursuit of diplomacy is vital to St. Lucia and can determine its grant funding. The posturing of this government in sensitive diplomatic theater shows a government ignorant of tactful 
and sensitive diplomacy. St. Lucia has been known to stand by the principles of respect for the rule of law, democracy, sovereignty, territorial integrity, human rights, and peaceful and just settlement of disputes. The recent showing by the government suggests a shift in the way we conduct our external relations. It appears that some good friends who have stood with us, particularly during very difficult periods, have been thrown under the proverbial bus. We have adopted the posture of the popular soccer song, Ducking. We ducked the vote on Israel at the United Nations. We ducked the vote at the UN General Assembly resolution condemning America's plan to move its Israeli embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. We voted against Venezuela and associated, and associated ourselves with the Lima Group and abandoned our association with CARICOM. The St. Lucia Labour Party is concerned with the current situation in Venezuela and believes that CARICOM as a collective should play a neutral and facilitating role in Venezuela and its individual member states should adhere to the position and refuse to be drawn into the positions of other groups of companies. We should never be seen as flip-flopping as a country, genuflecting on the altar of expediency. We call on the Prime Minister, who is also Minister of External Affairs, to clearly articulate St. Lucia's foreign policy. A St. Lucia Labour Party government would strengthen ties with our CARICOM neighbours, including Cuba, and we call for the removal of the trade embargo on the people of Cuba. While our government while our government, the government of the United Nations Party, demonstrates ingratitude towards some of the countries that have stood by us, we call on St. Lucians to remain grateful for the many countries that have stood alongside us in times of need. We on this side of the House remain thankful to the friendly countries for the support and pledge that we respect the sovereignty of all states and cherish the gifts that they give us, not destroy them. The CIP. Mr. Speaker, the position of the Solution Labour Party is clear. We believe that the CIP, as implemented by the UDIP, is fraught with problems and is very unlikely to reap the intended benefits. This has been evidenced by the last revenue estimates, with less than half of the projected revenue of $43 million being realized. 21 million from passport sales. Confidence in our CIP process has already taken a battering with a number of CIP passports issued to questionable characters being revoked and differences between revenue from passport sales and the number of CIP passports issued. And this re re requires further explanation by the government. The Minister of Finance handling handling of the CIP program is a shocking demonstration. This government goes to the money market to borrow at rates well between 5 and 8% per annum and is willing to lend money collected from our passport sales to foreign individuals at a rate of 2%. They borrow at 5 and 8% and they own lend at 2%. You can imagine that? The government believes that that is a wise thing to do because they want to, to give that money to foreigners to build hotels. Mr. Speaker, you heard the Prime Minister's response to Cambridge Analytica. The truth is that the story is growing and St. Lucia remains a subject of it. The Prime Minister has yet to make all the relevant information available to this house. The government may try to control the press in St. Lucia, to intimidate press people, but the world wide web cannot be censored, and the truth will eventually unfold. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister sounds very excited when he speaks of the holders of St. Lucian diplomatic passports. 
I would like the Prime Minister to disclose to this Honorable House how many diplomatic passports has the UWP government issued from June the 6th, 2016, and whether the recipients of these diplomatic passports were subject to the normal due diligence process. Mr. Speaker, the government has thwarted efforts to put, put in and do the policies reflect that? Sadly, the actions do not reflect their pronouncements. And here is why. The first act upon assuming office was to downgrade youth affairs from a full-fledged ministry of youth and put it in a cluster. Then they, then they allowed, not surprisingly, playing fields to deteriorate, becoming almost unplayable at some point and ensuring that a part of the 95% calculation of St. Lucian's employed under the NICE project in repairing and cleaning the playing fields were fired. They, they no longer had an op opportunity to look, to look after their families. Yes, they were fired. Those who were taking part, who were clean, who were taking care of playing fields, were fired. And as if their words about youth are the future, was not empty and hollow enough. They present estimates that contain no capital expenditure for youth development. But sure enough, $1.5 million in the estimates for consultancies and advertising has been set aside for foreign consultants. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister recommends that there must be discussion on state adoption of a poor, young, pregnant teenagers. But while he's doing that, he's removed the allocation for, for SMILE to assist young mothers. So directionless is the government that they are prepared to waste state funds on witch hunts, but can find no money for sporting equipment for our youth. Mr. Speaker, that's the government's record on youth development. In 2006, the St. Lucia Party government made $250,000 available in seed money made available to artists for financing sustainable income generating activities with the launch of the artist assistant program. Under that initiative, funds were made available to artists and entertainers in the months ranging from $5,000 to $20,000 in the form of grants for music production, equipment, recordings, music videos, and the purchase of musical equipment. This initiative yielded tremendous benefit and resulted in a marked improvement in the quality of music produced on the island by the NDC. It wasn't you. That, that was by the NDC. Anyhow, you, you, have to, you have to talk. <laughs> Could we hold the view that instead of this incentivizing the work of our brave young music partners, we should support and harness their, cre their creative abilities and initiatives with programs like the Artist Assistant Program. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Labour Party has confidence and belief in the young people of St. Lucia and will, whenever possible, make tangible investments in their overall development because we truly believe that the youth, that our future lies with them. Mr. Speaker, I move to gender issues. A St. Lucia Labour Party government will facilitate an environment that addresses gender imbalances through policies, programs, and other initiatives of promoting equity and social justice. These will include developing and implementing a comprehensive national response to gender-based violence, which will include a review of sexual abuse and domestic violence legislation. We will strengthen and establish of social support services for single parent households. We will be reviewing ch the children family laws, advancing the social, economic, and empowerment of women by ensuring equity and participation of women in positions of political leadership. The St. Lucia Labour Party salutes all women involved in the social and economic development of St. Lucia and thank them for their meaningful participation. Crime. Mr. Speaker, we all agree that the level of crime detection is unacceptable. When in opposition, when in opposition, this government use the incidence of crime as a weapon to attack the performance of the Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, we made great strides in addressing the issue of crime, but we never played 
the political card because we recognize the complexity of the crime issue. We recognize it. Mr. Speaker, the, the Prime Minister speaks about police stations. This government, in 1997, were the only government to ever, were the only government in 1997, to build police stations in Marshall, Marigo, Viewfort, Denry, repairs to the, to the, to the, to, in Richfort. We were the government that, the only government that, and even the last fire station that they, that they, that they, that they opened in Babano was built by the St. Michel Party. We built fire stations. So, we built fire stations. Yes, the fire station in Babano, the fire station in Babano? The fire station in Babano? Okay. You like your turn, Chief. I, I, I get involved in no argument. You have your turn. We, we, so we, so we knew, we knew of the, of the problems and issues of policemen. And I can, and I can speak proudly about the issues as they relate to policemen. Because my deceased father was a policeman. So I understand, I understand the issues as they relate to policemen. Why necessary, Mr. Speaker, why we call on the government to take leadership in the fight against crime and make available adequate resources to the police? While very necessary, while very necessary, the police communications unit is not sufficient capital investment in the fight against crime. We salute members of the police force, the majority of whom do their best in a challenging working environment to keep us safe. In our fight against crime, the government needs to resist the temptation to make political capital out of the work of the director of public prosecutions. The DPP is a constitutional position, and its independence must be preserved at all times. If he is to be perceived as fair and effective in carrying out his duties, we urge the government to respect the constitutional position of the DPP and refrain from giving the impression that he is a functionary of the executive. And with regards to day-to-day -day management of the police, the St. Lucia Labour Party believes that there should be no, no political interference in the day-to-day -day workings of the police. And the commissioner of police should be allowed the freedom to conduct police operations in a professional and non-partisan manner. There should be no political interference in the police force. Since the, Mr. Speaker, I move to a vexing issue, which is public spaces and beaches. Since the withdrawal of the subvention from National Trust by this government, we have noticed a steady encroachment of hotels and other developments on our beaches and public spaces. The Dolphin Park has disappeared to come back in another, another time and another manner. The government elected to serve the interests of the people appears unconcerned and in many cases are active facilitators of this growing encroachment on our beaches and public spaces. The St. Lucia Labour Party reaffirms its position that all beaches are for the enjoyment of all St. Lucians and visitors, and we remain public with unfettered access. Mr. Speaker, we note the clearing of an area of land near VG Airport. We believe that this area should be acquired through negotiation by the government and kept for public enjoyment. Mr. Speaker, we urge the government to investigate the uncontrolled sand mining in Miku. We urge the government to investigate the uncontrolled sign mining in Miku as we speak, as it's going to be a major environmental disaster. The sand mining that is taking place in Miku. And I will not, I will not disclose who is doing the sand mining. Hiwanora International Airport.
Mr. Oh. Speaker, the Prime Minister has spoken about the redevelopment of Hiwanora International Airport. The government has rejected the public-private partnership agreement that, is, that would have been supervised and monitored by the IFC and arm of the World Bank. All plans for the construction of a modern state of the art of International Airport had been finalized. We work about to commence without the government incurring any related debt. The airport will have been leased for a period of 40 years, and at the end, commercial control will revert back to the government of Lucia. This agreement had three major benefits. One, oversight of the project will have been done by a competent agent, the World Bank, the IFC. There will be no additional debt incurred by the government, and we will have a long-awaited state of the art in national airports. Having rejected and cancelled the agreement, in September 2017, the government was offered by the investment arm of the Canadian government to enter into a memorandum of understanding and to provide all the expertise designing, financing, construction, constructing, and delivering the airport and the North-South Highway. The project will have been guaranteed by the Canadian government with no debt financing by the government of St. Lucia. And Mr. Speaker, I challenge the Prime Minister to make available to, make available to this House the memorandum of understanding that was sent to him for his signature from the Canadian, from the Canadian, from the Canadian government. I challenge him. Mr. Speaker, the government has spurned this offer and has not even had the decency of communicating its position to the Canadian government. Meanwhile, they are trying to contract the works to the. Mr. Speaker, the question remains. Why is the government persistent in trying to avoid dealing with reputable international agencies that encourage good governance, especially as it relates to the procurement of goods and services and the employment of contractors? Mr. Speaker, we appear to be re revisiting the age of a and We appear to be re revisiting the age of a and which is still a subject of investigation by the U.S. State Attorney. You recall, Mr. Speaker, that when the UDIP last governed in 2001, A&M had failed the due diligence test and its proposal to undertake work at HIA was rejected by the douche bank. Can the Prime Minister tell this Honorable House, what are the contractual relationships between his government and the company or its look-alike for the development of HIE. The public wants to know. The Prime Minister needs to clarify the procurement methods and whether an open tender process will be used given the size of this HIE development project. Mr. Speaker, this airport redevelopment project has been the source of much discussion and speculation. There has been talk of interference in the process of awarding contracts, allegations of bribery, investigations by the U.S. State Attorney, and promises by the Prime Minister to investigate, to form a small committee to investigate requests and to, to, to investigate what's in the public domain. We still await the results of the investigation by that small committee. Mr. Speaker, let me make it clear. This would be one of the largest infrastructure projects to be undertaken in St. Lucia, and it must be done right. The Prime Minister must ensure total transparency, accountability, and prudence in the execution of this project. DSH. Mr. Speaker, our position on this project remains. There has not been enough consultation on the environmental, social, and economic impact on livelihoods of the people directly involved. We believe that this project is too risky and surrenders too much land, 1,000 acres to one man at 97 cents per acre, and the sale of our passports. The government should listen. If it fails, the Senusha Party will pursue the matter at another level.
Mr. Speaker, this budget will not reap the intended benefits because the damage has already been done. Since 2016, when this government came into office, and they have done little in this budget to correct the loss momentum. The policies of the last government and the social economic review says it, place the fiscal position of this country on a path of sustainability. But the United Workers Party reversed it by stopping key capital projects, imposing a hefty fuel tax on the transport sector, and depleted the Treasury with unnecessary generous incentives to foreigners. This budget, Mr. Speaker, is nothing more than a blunt instrument designed by a Minister of Finance with a narrow and limited understanding of what it takes to grow and sustain a balanced economy. That will provide no hope for our young people, expand and grow small businesses, and improve the lives of the vast majority of citizens. What can I tell the residents of Touj and Bagatelle and Rock Hall and Arendelle Hill? What can I tell them is in the budget for them? What can I tell them in the budget when the government spends more money on consultants than on public assistance? What can I tell them, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, the Labour Party I lead is indeed fundamentally different from the government. Fundamentally different. Our development philosophy is based on upholding and promoting a set of economic policies which is embodied, embodied in a commitment to bread, freedom, and justice for all St. Lucians. The St. Lucia Labour Party, when in government, will seek to advance national development by creating economic opportunities for the many, not friends, family, and foreigners, uplifting the workers of the country, protecting the most vulnerable, while creating an enabling environment for the private sector to grow and, and flourish. A Labour Party government will never be arrogant. It will never be revengeful. It will never be dismissive. A Labour Party government will understand that people have a right to express their opinion and will take what is, what is good from that opinion and reject what they consider to be bad. But this arrogance and this revengefulness and this dismissal will never be encouraged by the St. Lucia Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, a Labour Party government will encourage a divergence of views to allow the use of the collective knowledge experience and intelligence of all the people of St. Lucia, rather than a few, rather than a few, who mistakenly believe that because they have been elected, they and their friends have all the answers to our challenges as a nation. We shall seek to continue the journey started earlier, to provide affordable health care for every St. Lucian without the need to privatize public health services. And the next Labour Party government shall continue its tradition of embarking upon economic policies that will bring about stable growth, stable growth as opposed to the high-risk economic policies that disrupt and destroy existing livelihoods and lick a chance of long-term success. Mr. Speaker, a St. Lucia Labour Party government will be humble. We'll understand humility. We'll understand that we are custodians only for a time. We'll understand that we shall not be there forever. So we will not display arrogance and haughtiness and revengefulness and the desire to ridicule and to intimidate and to victimize their opponents. The St. Lucia Labour Party understands that, Mr. Speaker. And the St. Lucia Labour Party will not will not be threatened regardless of all the investigations. The St. Lucia Labour Party will not be intimidated regardless of all the threats to control press freedom. The St. Lucia Labour Party will not be silenced even if even if you pick out certain members of our side for investigation. We ask you we ask you to continue to do the work that was started for the benefit of the people of St. Lucia. And whilst we are on this 
Why is we on this? We want to tell you that the St. Lucia Labour Party had left the framework for a diabetic center in St. Lucia. We urge you to continue to look into the, look into the construction of that diabetic center. There is no time, Mr. Speaker. The country is in need of healing. The country is in need of the country is in need of planning. The country is going nowhere. And even if even if we sit in our tower of Babel, in our ivory tower, and even if we believe that we have a God-given right and we'll be in power forever. That will not happen. It cannot happen. So I urge the government of St. Lucia, I urge the government of St. Lucia to be humble, to be less, re be less revengeful, to be less revengeful, to stop the victimization of contractors that they perceive not to support them, to stop the ideas of saying that people will never get work under the dead, or not over the dead bodies, we must stop the black, must stop the blacklisting, must stop the blacklisting of contractors, must stop the dismissal of regular people because you believe there's a part of their party, of their party, not forgetting that they have families to feed, and in their families they may be, they may be families, they may be cousins, they may be godchildren who are members of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, I cannot support this budget. This budget is full of empty promises, and this budget is doomed for failure. I thank you.